Right, folks, welcome to uh, another very special episode of the podcast, Keeping With The, the Coaching Team this week. We're joined, I'm delighted to say, we're joined by speed coach Martin Bentley. Martin, how's the form? Martin, how's the form? I'm very good, thanks. Nice to hear from you. Come here, so I think most people, whether it be from reading on our own site or coming across you on Instagram or reading elsewhere, would know or be at least be familiar with your work at this stage. But for those who aren't, can you give kind of a brief outline of what it is you do and how you ended up doing it? Well, how I ended up doing it was probably got me to what I do. So I'll start there. I'm a soldier. That's my, my profession. I'm in the army for about 16 years. Um, that was in Galway, in 1st Battalion in Galway. Uh, and I worked training people all my life in the army. Um, like, well, I did an NCO course after about six years in. And from then on, I was training people. Uh, that's their job. So I trained a lot of recruits, trained a lot of NCO courses and cadets which are six months long up to a year and three months long. And that's um, constantly working on building a bond and uh, turning the robustness and resilience into a group and while putting leadership characteristics into them as well. And throughout that day, I suppose, I went to do a, I did a sports massage course once and I met Tony Griffin on that course. And um, at the time I was into sprinting, I was doing a lot of sprinting. I had done a lot of boxing. I was also playing hurling. I liked to dabble in everything. Um, and uh, but at this stage, I was very caught up in the sprinting. And when I met Griffith, then he was very interested in that. Tony was very open minded and always thinking ahead. And he'd he seen a gap there that he could exploit. Like, so he asked me what I do, but I work with him. So I did. And at the time, at the time, weights weren't as big a thing like in Ireland. Yeah. And uh, I was I was doing a good bit of it at the time for the sprinting. And, and Tony, Tony realized he, he was missing out on a kind of a, missing out on games we got there. With strength, so we did a good bit of strength first. We kept now the clear setup until about March that year because we rec- we, we realised he, he found it very hard to put on weight, and he said he was struggling under high balls and stuff. So we, we put on a bit of strength and power on him first, maybe only about two or three kg, but kind of a effective muscle, like and very lean muscle because that was his body type. And I did a lot of sprint work with him, mecha- mechanics, a lot of mechanics, a lot of sprint work, and I went out then. He gave me a lovely thank you letter from Canada. So um, that was the start. And I didn't look, it just happened by meeting friends. And the next one was another friend, Bonner Maher, while in the army. Uh, I was great friends with Bonner's brother, Jack. We were in a room together in Lebanon. And Jack kind of made the connection and Bonner asked me to do the work with him. And I followed kind of the same protocol I had done with Tony. Now, Bonner wouldn't have needed the strength, except he had gone through recruit training. And recruit training is a lot of 10 kilometer runs, 15 kilometer runs, backpacks on, your high endurance and... You're probably eating into muscle by the end, but you know, you wouldn't be half the athlete that you went in. So, um, same, followed similar protocol, not, not a blueprint or anything, just looked at what needed to do. And then I figured it was, you needed to increase calories, do a good bit more weights to get his strength up. And then again, we worked on sprinting mechanics and Bonner had a great year as well. Had a, had an all-star. Two great hurlers. I was lucky to meet them. The all-star, just a coincidence that their team was going to end that year. They were probably going to be in line for them anyway, but it probably gave me more recognition than I deserved out of it. These were two super athletes and animals. And um, so after that, then the next step I did, I suppose, was I worked with a boxer, Darren Cruz, got him a uh, professional boxer in an all Ireland title fight. Uh, it was a draw. Um, and after that, then it was Kulari. Uh, Joachim and Kelly gave me a call one night to win with him with Kulari. It was meant to be in for three or four sessions and it ended up being the year. And Kulari were written off, sure they were in relegation playoff, I think, or not far from it. And, Sure, they rose from the dead and won the county title and had a great run in Leinster. And that kind of set me then on the pig's back, like, because they, again, now they, they probably gave me too many mentions. Um, and there was a lot more people involved than me. And those guys, they achieved the impossible. So they deserve the credit. But it, it got me, um, I suppose, a profile that I don't know if I was even looking for it, but it happened anyway. And I suppose I opened an Instagram page then and I just used it to, right and quite expressive anyway and I just wrote to write my feelings and my thoughts and my philosophies and more so or even recognizing the teams and the athletes and what they were doing. I, I loved giving them the, the kind of uh, the recognition for what and to get it out. Um and that was what happened. And after that it was I suppose uh Dean Cal contacted me after reading an article in the Irish Times and I went in with Waterford and I knew from talking to Liam Day one, this would be good. Like, I just knew by him. I just said, like, this will be good. You know, I was in talks with one or two other teams, but I had a 10 minute phone call with him and I said, 
Would you give me a few days to you back? He said, yeah. And I think I rang him back in three minutes. Like, he just said, come on, when do we need? Like, I said, this, I want to do this. Like, so I'm, and now I'm back with Kulgari. Left Kulgari for a year or two. And we're back in the county final now this year, which is great. Like, so they're rising from the dead again. And there's some men, they can, there's no end to their, they're like the mushrooms. They come up out there overnight and they're good mushrooms. Like, they're, they're great lads, whatever's in them. And there's some club. So that's, so you, that's the you, kind of the story. You've touched on a lot there. What I do, I see. Yeah, There's a lot I yeah, want to yeah, ask sorry. you about in a second here. Um, but course, just I want yeah, to follow up on something you've just said there, Martin, because I think it's it's important. And it, a lot of people, I'm conscious that a lot of people are going to be listening to this and they'll try and glean little tidbits out of it. Um, and we spoke to Eamon McGee last week about coaching and the specifics of, of coaching, especially about working with people. And I do think, you know, the way I, I wrote a piece about you last year after speaking to Ross King, and as when I knew I was going to talk to you today again, I touched base with a few different people just to see, get a sense of, your work and you know it's often said about coaches that uh you know nobody really cares how much you know but every player knows how much you care and i think i wonder is that something overlooked by a lot of people but from speaking to people that work with you it's definitely not something you overlook like you do seem to be very invested in the human behind the athlete and it seems to be a large focus of what you actually do with them yeah yeah all i care about to be honest and it's it's i think all that matters like like, I, I know as much technical stuff as there is to know. Like, I, I get obsessed with, with, with what I'm into. And I mean, like, I've gone to every seminar I can go to. I follow everyone I go to. And the knowledge seems to be, well, some stuff can be left to feel. It. There's nothing new as far as I can see, like, in the last 30 years. Sports science will come up with new tests, new methods. They'll call intervals, different things like mass runners. But it's all the same. It's, it's all boils down to interval running. It's mass running or you want to call it whatever same thing and I think I I love to believe in the potential in the human and I, and I believe in inspiration and motivation and I think like suppose we could learn this year like it's proof in the pudding we're, we're definitely not the best team in the county well no we're not the best hurling team in the county but we, we count ourselves the best team and the manager now in fairness Brian Culbert from Clare he said that to me numerous times like we're, we're not the best hurling but we are the best team and we have to believe we can be more than we are if we're to beat better teams than us. Yeah. And we still do. We still believe we can do it and we do it like, you know, but like to do that, you have to, like, if we just go out and say, right, this is who we have and this is what we can do. On paper, we're not much, you know, but but together when we're fighting for our lives together, like we're, we're something, you know, and I suppose I focus a lot on that. Like like every night we, we go some, we, we go, we try to go further. Like, um, I suppose we micro or something. We we never go away from that. Like sometimes teams do a lot of that early in the season, and then they step away from it and they go. Oh, it's all short sharp stuff now. But we don't do that. Like like we we stay we stay building joint stamina, mindset. Like you know we we always suffer a bit more. We call it. We always say we're looking for new territory, and we have to find it up there first, and then we find it in the bodies. Like so, I mean, um, yeah. But to do that, you have to have a bunch of players that are open minded and. Uh, like we ask them the year what we do to win, and they say anything. But then we remind them sometimes of that during the year, like this is anything, you know, this is now anything, you know. You can't be a savage on Sunday and not be a savage on the Tuesday before it, you know. So we we build them even mentally, like there's no break out there. Like we won't do an easy night the Tuesday before the county final, like you know, there's we didn't do it all year before any game, so we won't do it now, you know. But but again, now sometimes that's not the right environment. So, you might get you know, and players that are looking for a lot of testing and results and you know and stuff that's uh, cutting edge. And we've sacrificed that in Kulari now this year. I mean, we sacrificed that for. We went to what we did in 2018. We just go on hardship and we believe in suffering and we we'll suffer on the day. And whoever, as Liam Cal said to me about that great and Kenny team, he said they could just suffer longer than anyone else, and it never left my head. I really believe them. I really believe that like they could just suffer longer than anyone else. So that's our plan anyway. So, um, and, and for anybody who's listening and wondering about what you're talking about there, Martin, can you give, I know you can't go into, you know, the, the new details of what it is you do, but can you give an example okay, of how you would foster that yeah. resilience? You know, it, it's interesting, like, for example, Ross mentioned that the bond that generated between the two of you at the time was actually oftentimes just in the car in conversations he had away from training. It wasn't to do training at all. I think I'm led to believe, you know, a lot of the work you did with someone like Conor Moyer was actually over the phone. Like, there's obviously different ways of developing that, I suppose, spirit within an, a player. But especially when it comes to a team environment, there must be, a, you know, an extra degree of a challenge. 
Mm. Well, they're the guys are after him, and they're like that. They're they're as special as they come, really. Like like really, Ross yeah. and Connor, they're they're so far actually they're, they're so open minded and forward thinking. Like you know, they 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 often come saying they're looking for three percent, you know, two percent, but. You know, there's way more than that to be got. Like, like I see guys worrying about sleeping more, which I sleep more. Am I drinking like is eight ounces of water enough? And I'm saying like, you're drinking eight ounces of water, you're sleeping eight hours, but you're not working like a savage. Like you come to the field and you don't give everything. You've prepped everything all day. Like you know, you've you've laid out your meals. You've you've left your partner. You come up here. You've planned it from the night before, and then you come up and you only give eight out of ten. Like, and it doesn't make sense. And that's. That's where we, I, I just find a lot of, sometimes it can be very easy to start worrying about the micros and the macro isn't happening. Like, like the micros only come into effect, I, I think, when the macro is being hit and, it, and hit, hit relentlessly, uh, like every night. Like, you know, not, not just, okay, like it has to be hit relentlessly every night. And then I worry about the macros then, like, you know. Um, but, but Connor, you know, I did a lot of work with Connor over the phone. It's it obviously the distance, you know. Um, but uh, we met them. We met a good bit up in uh, DCU. I think it was DCU. It was in, um, yeah, it was. We, we met up there like two or three times. But he, he was just obsessed with, with knowledge. Like, Connor's going to be an unbelievable coach from there. Like, he's, like, we had great conversations. We were doing the same reading. We were, we went to a lot of the same books, a lot of the same people. And uh, that was an easy connection, you know. So, them guys are easy to work with. Like, and they, they don't just accept what you tell them either. They, they're inquisitive. Like, they, they want to know why will it work? What does it work like? You know, what am I doing wrong? What have I been doing wrong? How will this improve my game? It's not just, and that's what I love. I don't just want someone prescribe me exercises, you know, because I've often done exercises in the gym for eight weeks and no change and prescribed exercises, but then gone and bought something I believed in and worked on that. You can just prescribe exercises and not challenge or work on the athlete like at all like you know like i always say when someone's trying to lose weight like i've often seen my mother trying to lose weight and she'll drop a stone and she'll never see it till someone tells her yeah so like i think it's important as well to constantly build these athletes as well as as you're killing them you're telling them you couldn't do this too or like you know and i always that the team that we are in the final should be able to eliminate the team that we were in the first round you know, and sometimes I, I, I've seen that that doesn't happen, you know, under my own watch as well. Like, you know, sometimes it doesn't happen. But like we try to be, we have a quote, we have a saying out there, we'll be two weeks better every two weeks. And we, we do that by not hoping for it. We, we push, we will push the meters and we'll push the time and we'll push, we'll push the energy and the effort. That's massive. Like we're boxing on the pads for a minute. It has to be louder, more aggressive, more chaotic. Like we try to get used to chaos. It's, and it's beautiful. But after like, Everyone empties, and I mean that's the best thing. We're all in love for believing it's brilliant, like, <laughs> you know. And, and I wouldn't like to do it any other way. I wouldn't like to be standing there, knowing we've left twenty percent for Thursday night, you know, on a Tuesday, you know, or on a Friday night, which I'm sorry, wouldn't like to stand there knowing we left twenty percent. Like we, we try and hit a max every night we go there and get new territory if we can. I don't know. We don't test it, so maybe it's not new territory, but we believe it is, and sometimes that's strong enough. Like, and it, it, it's a pitfall, I think. Uh, a lot of coaches can learn from, you know, there's a lot of, there's an obsession, I think, particularly in the GA, actually, Martin, with, um, you know, spending money and what we do as opposed to how we do it. And I think if, you know, you're going back to something, like, you know, it's not about necessarily the fact that you have, or I'm sure, you know, Limerick has spoken a lot about the boxing that they use in the training, but it's not about the fact that they're boxing, it's about how they are training the way they are. How they are training the way they are. Yeah. Favorite, what we do is how we do it. I love that. Like, if it's so true. But like we use boxing because like if I was to push any team to the stage, I need to push push them to find new territory in the heart and lungs and cause the heart rate to go up near 200 or 190, 200. Like if I, if I use the legs for that, there'll be a huge buildup of lactic acid, there'll be huge fatigue. And I can't demand like you, you, can, you push legs like that too much and they'll snap. Like you'll get quad pulls, you'll get calf pulls. So only so much work they can take. So we just use boxing as a tool to exhaust ourselves. You know, and then when it comes to running, then like we're we're always we're light, we're conditioned, and they do so much running in hurling. We can actually demand a higher play, pace in the hurling because we're not fatiguing their legs before hurling with, with runs, and we're not they're not saving stuff in their hurling because they know we're going to fatigue them at the end with runs. So that's the deal we make. Like we say we won't run. Any, I only run, and I do is for mechanics and speed. 
It's just mechanics mostly. Um, we do that maybe every night. Um, far as Sundays, Sundays all hurling to, to just let go and enjoy hurling. But the two nights during the week, they'll be running mechanics early. They'll be shoving, pushing, and pulling to build the energy system for the rocks and the dirty balls. And we up that every week. And then uh, they'll go and they'll hurl. And they've abandoned them in the hurling because they're not asking them. To, they're not fatigued from running. They're not going to be fatigued at the end. So they're not saving themselves knowing there's heavy running coming at the end. And then we go and we box. We box till we empty. Like We, we box till they're on their knees. Like, and what they do, they do. I don't have to drive that anymore. Like, you know, it's, they drive that now. And that's, you know, that's that's what, what I always say. That's what winning looks like. When I see that happen, and I know we're in a good place. When I see the players on the pads roaring in the guy's face, not giving them an easy time because he knows he won't get an easy time next week. And they'll need them to be able to cope under pressure. So... When I see players doing that, like to me, that's success in itself. Like no matter how this final goes, as long as we empty on the day, and we're okay with that. Like the, the proudest day I've ever had in Ireland was, it was actually Kudari and Bally Bowden, a game that went to extra extra time, and like it was phenomenal. Like and we we lost that game, like you know, fair and square, we lost it, and uh, but we had empty. We had, we were bringing on so thirty six years of age, played middle of the field. He had gone off early in the game, coming back in. It was just. And they were just exhausted. And I remember the last huddle. And I had been in every huddle driving it, driving it. And I got to the last huddle. And I just stood back and watched the minute. There was a guy like putting tape around his shin for shin splints. Like, doesn't make sense. But doing just for his head, doing whatever it took. And other guys like driving it. But we were beaten. Like, we, we were the four points down going into that last. And that's the, for me, like, to just stand back and watch them not giving up and throwing the kitchen sink. And they're exhausted. To me, I don't know if that will ever be beaten for me. Like, it was amazing. So it's the ultimate performance to give everything you have. It's the ultimate performance, regardless of the result, to give everything you have. We often don't do that even when we win. Like So to see that, that was just, it was everything we spoke about all year, the accumulation of it. It was brilliant. Magic. Wow. Uh, come here, I better ask you about speed uh, eventually. Yeah. How much How much unattached or untouched potential do you think there is in the average GA player? Or maybe I'll phrase this question a different way. How often would you see an improvement in a player at the end of a session versus what you saw him at the start of a session, at the first session? Oh, she was huge. Like, I mean, like mechanics is everything. Like when I was hurling, I was probably in the top five on the team. And then I went and learned sprinting mechanics. And I was just very lucky. I encountered a great guy, Dick O'Hanlon, in the army. And he was massive into it, like uh, from a huge athletics background. And he put a lot of time into me. And so when I went back to the season, I was five meters ahead of everyone. Like my 90% pace now, my 90% effort was now better than their 100%. And that's what I see hurling as. Like any reports we get with matches, there's not many lads hit their PBs on the match day. They're always 90% of the PBs they set in training, which makes sense. Like if you do a 100 meter sprint, you're so fresh. But if you to do four of them, your times will drastically drop. Like, and it, it, so on. Like, hurlers are doing how many meters at high speed running? I don't know. It's in the hundreds anyway. You know, so actually, probably in the kilometers, a high speed running, like anything. Match reports, suppose, would say like between 80 and 90% on match day is, the, is the, the, the high speed running. That's like running off the shoulder, winning the ball. When you think about it, it has to be because you have to be able to look up and observe. In 100 meters, you don't get to do that. It's head down, burning down yeah. the track line. It's straight lines. So all you can think of is max effort. But in Harlem, it can't be max effort because if someone got in front of you, you need to be at a pace that you can control. So able to jink left or right or hit the brakes or, or pass. You can't do that at max, max speed. So it's as fast as they can possibly go with the ball while bringing decision-making in and perception and all these other words. But I mean, it's not, um, it's not max speed. So that's the big thing, I think. A lot of teams train at max speed when they're doing it. And I know they say max speed, it's uh, what they call a speed reserve that will bring on your 90. But I just want to get way better at 90 than any other team. Like That's what I try to do. Like Make our 90 what their 100 is. And mechanics will do that. Because what most what hurlers do a lot is they keep trying to accelerate. And if you keep trying to accelerate, you can't keep getting faster and faster. So the body will break down. And that's why you'll see a lad chasing a lad often. A good fast lad will be running down the field, lad, and out chest them, and he'll fall away. Then you'll see him breaking down and actually come to nearly a stop. He nearly looks like he's fallen. And we think his, his legs burned out, and they probably did burn out. I mean, when you're using force, we can only use force for up to seven seconds, max force, before our body starts to ATP production and all that and start to break down. So, I mean, um, I like to get them at 90% and able to cover that. And anyone, anyone I do the work with, like, it surprised me for, for the first year I was probably put out 
And then I, I was asking them, how are you finding it? What's the benefits? And they all went to, they said, geez, it's not even the speed as much as how easy I can cover 40 meters over and back. And at first I was like, oh. But then when it all made sense to me, I was like, okay, that's brilliant. Because that's what the game is. The game has gone so much in hurling and straight lines, running off the shoulder, support runs, up and back. You can do them at 90% and not be tired from using max effort. Your max effort only lasts so long and you'll burn out pretty fast. Like. So if I think hurling is like, they're so conditioned. They're so strong, so powerful. And often they don't know how to use that. So I always say it's like striking a ball. If you want to strike a ball over the bar from 60 meters and it's falling 10 meters short, you're not going to go into the gym and start doing cables every day and pulling, trying to increase your tonnage on the cables. You're not going to do that. You're going to strike the free. You're going to work on technique, leverage, timing, and repetitions. And eventually that will come. It's technique. And running is like that. There's leverage with your feet hitting the ground and, like, and your body coming over the foot. There's um, timing when your feet strike. There's mechanics alone. You know, there's, there's a lot of factors there that it's not just so good way I can put it actually. I often use this. The, the three stages of human movement, to my eye anyway, are walking, running, and sprinting. And what happens, I think, a lot is people, we walk, and then there's this big distinct movement from walking to running. And there should be a distinct uh, gap between running and sprinting, but there's often not because they run really fast. They run really fast, but sprinting is different. And it's as distinct as walking to running is from running to sprinting. It's that distinct. You see a guy really sprinting like, and you're like, whoa, okay, he's moving. But running fast is different. You, you don't come off the heels. Your legs don't come any higher. There, uh, there's a lot of inside mechanics, backside mechanics. Like running, running fast is what I see a lot of. Like, and, and not actually breaking into that full open sprint with the chest up and the arms pumping. And the arms, I don't mind the arms because we carry a hurl, but you'll know by the legs and even the body position. And it's more erect, more upright, more forward. And uh, the legs are coming higher then to compensate the, the forward momentum and the weight forward. So it's very distinctive, and um, I don't see a lot of people doing it. One or two natural guys I used to see, like Carl Nocton. Do you remember him with Carl? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if he was sprint, but he ran really well. And Damien Cahillan, actually, like, who I worked with, but like, they had done an athletics background, and he showed so much. Like, you know, so um, there's a few there that, that come, come through the sports that you see move right. Like, I know there's a few in football as well. I think there's a me, actually, a sprinter for me. I uh, just I haven't seen as much of the football in the last year or two, but... There's a few that come along and the, and the gap is huge. When they start running, like the gap is huge. Like when, you know, even Desi Hutchinson, like Desi had a lot of that stuff done and he was just lightning. And, you know, but like now there's a few with him, you know, there's a few up there with him. But like, the, I think there's, I think there's definitely untapped potential. And I don't think you need to go into the gym to do it. I think it's actually mechanics. You look all the NFL, most of the drafts are picked from high school track teams. Like they've all got their speed. They're all in track in college. I think it was 67% of the draft one year in the last two years or something, we're all track athletes. Like, they're the best sprinters in the world Latin in the Olympics, a lot of them in the NFL. Like, you know, the, the, you see their times like against sprinters and there's very little in it. And these guys have to do weights, they have to do agility, they have to do so much else and yet they're so close. Like, you know, and a lot of that was from track, track, like, you know, track is, we don't do track in this country as much as America, but those guys got super quick on the track. Like, in all the sprint clubs I go to, you know, like, you don't start looking into the gym until you've come near your PB, like, you know. And in Harlem, we're so far off from PB before we send them into increase your strength, increase your power. But they have to even tap into what their natural speed is because they have the mechanics to do it. Can you talk to us a small bit about it? So you did a piece with Dennis Walsh uh, in the Sunday Times last year, which was very good. And you mentioned during that that if someone comes to you and asks you or tells you they want to get faster, your first reaction is to say, Why? As in, how are you going to use it? Which I think is not something, you know, when I read that, I kind of had to stop and think and think, how could you actually explain how you want to use your speed? But I suppose from your perspective, why is it important that they know that before they start out? Yeah, because like, like how fast is fast enough? How strong is strong enough? Like, like before it becomes diminishing returns. Like if I send someone into a gym for a year, like after the end of the year, like the first three months of that is going to be massive growth. But then it becomes diminishing returns. And it's the same with speed. It's the same with strength. Like, so I, I don't think it's, you know, they want it on their CV. But if you're faster, how can that make your game better? I think that's awfully important. Before you go 
source them something that could take you a lot of energy to get and possibly wherever we're putting our energy, we're not putting it somewhere else. So you're going to be neglecting other parts while you're working on something with that much intensity, which is fine as long as you can see it directly how that's going to improve your game. Like I, I said that to Bonner, I said, like, like, I know you're a worker. I know you're a worker. I know you go from side to side. But when you get the ball, that has to be go direct at the goal line. It has to be. I'm saying with Griffin, like, it's, you know, don't, don't just get the speed and go out there when I'm faster now and I'm going to be better. You're not unless you find ways to bring that into your game. So, like, but the, I, I wouldn't just say that for speed. I'd say that for every athlete. Like, what's your strength? What are your strengths? Know your strengths. And, and stick to them as, as, well, as often as you can. Like, there was, wasn't there a survey done, like, in Barcelona where they, they all kicked, like, with a weaker foot and their weaker foot came on by 20%. But your strong foot went back by 30% yeah. or something. So, yeah. So, like, I just think know your strengths. And, like, if you're going to get faster and that's going to be a strength of yours, how do you get off? Are you going to collect the ball? Have you a sidestep worked out? Have you an image in your head of your roots? Like, or are you just going to be collecting the ball and tip tapping and hit it over your shoulder? Because you didn't need speed for that. Like, you were doing that already. You didn't even need speed for that. So, just, just keep getting better and putting it over your shoulder. But if you're going to get speed, well, then, to sell your dummies, work out what you're going to do and have your roots to go like you have to have a sell before you can apply the speed like, you know, I know you can turn and go direct, but like, you know like about their strength anyway, I'd say, right, they're your strengths how do we get them into the game more often and don't try to be everyone, don't try to be all things to all people, like like we have certain players and they're not going to be Brian Carr they're not going to get the ball and stick it over from 60 yards on the run or Kevin Connolly but like but they can be guys who get to every rock and move the man and win the ball and burst out of it and give the hand pass to them to put the ball over the back. You know, so I think we have to find players' strengths and get them to utilize them as often as possible. And because like your strength of what gets you when you get like they're what gets you noticed, there's what what got you on the team. And as soon as you start neglecting them to become someone else, you know, you you're you're not someone else. Your your strengths are your strengths and, and they're good enough, like you know, sometimes they're good enough. But maybe you're not using them enough. Sometimes we don't see what we are, we see what we're not. You know, we focus a lot on what we haven't got. When we have something and we use it more, we could be brilliant. So if I, if I go see... Speed, I do that. If I go see... Yeah. <laughs> if, if, if I come to you and I say I want to get faster, can you give us a, a brief outline of what that first session looks like? How, how does your work begin? How does your work begin? Well, the first thing I'm going to say is why do you want to get faster? You're a journalist behind the mic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say, uh, I suppose the first thing we're going to do is, sorry, the first thing we're going to do is uh, talk to you, figure out what you're doing, what your game is, what your goals are, how important it is to you, then why it's important, why you need it, because you need to know them things before you believe it. Like, if I'm just telling you you're going to get speed and you're going to get faster, like, it's not that of much value to you. So, like, it must be, it has to be of a lot of value to you if you're coming, seeking it out, because they're always going to be working it, you know? And, if it's not much value to you, it's just go, I'd like to be faster. Loads of people say, I'd like to be faster, you know. But, you know, it's, it's going to take a lot of sustained repetitions. Like. But um, in that first session, we'll warm you up and get you to run as hard as we can for 60 meters. Like, the longer it is, the more I can see. Now, by the way, I don't do this because I get a lot of individuals reaching out these days. And, and I don't. I'm with teams, and teams is what I love, you know. So I, I have to really be, um, really be uh, kind of, I don't know, Particular. picky these days. Like I do, like, yeah, because I'm I'm busy with teams and I'm terrible at saying no. I, I can't say no, so anyway. But um yeah, we'll get you to the message and after this podcast. Okay. Anyone who's listening is the <laughs> unless, unless you have a, unless you have a team. <laughs> <laughs> I love the team. I love the team environments. But um no, but yeah, we'll get you to run sixty meters, uh probably time you through the gates just for a rough time. We'll do it at ninety percent, you know, not flat out, like uh ninety percent, ninety-five, push it flat out, but just we want to sell the high risk area, you know. Um then we'll we'll have a look at it. I'll take a few screenshots, where the knees are, where the legs are passing, where they pass in the air like the shoulder, or is the one foot down before they pass. Um, how much heels are kicking at the bum? That's, you know, they're the things you don't want. How much are you on the ball of your foot? Where's your foot landing? You know, is it landing behind you? I know too far in front of you that it's actually breaking system. But how we break is we throw a foot in front of you, we run downhill and I ask you to stop. You dig your heel in. We're the same on the feet through the play. Look how tight the bark of the screw is. Still with the, the, the heel went into the ground to stop them and that pressure. So, um, 
the heel is a braking system, so we have to make sure the heel is off the ground and you're not landing too far in front of your body. You will be touching down slightly in front of your body till your weight comes over the leg, and that's wow. the leverage you're talking about. And then you're pushing off, okay? So people say your foot over the left angle, okay? Um, they're the things we look at. And then I'll show drills, I'll demonstrate drills, which I've done over years. Because I, I, I think, like, you know, being able to do the things is a big help as well. Like, you know, just sometimes I'm with a team and I know after a year or two, it's sounding the same because basics work. Like I have three drills, three drills, but they're done proper. Like, and I don't see them done proper many places. You know, I see them doing high knees that they can't actually run out of. So if I say do high knees and run out, but to do high knees and it's beautiful, and then you tell them to run and they change everything and they run out. And then it's not a drill that's going to stick. So it has to stick. Like the high knees is just to get your knees up and to help you running, but but you have to move as you're going to run. You know, it doesn't work. It's a lie and it's something we, we practice but never 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 use like. So I like to do the drill and run over with the drill for about 30 meters. And then we'll do a heel recovery drill, how to get the heel back to attack the next step instead of kicking at the ass. Because if it kicks up at the bum, you have to whip it back to the ground really fast and it shortens your stride. So it has to come through the body and into a high knee. So We'll do that and we run out of it and just a simple scissor bleed and run out of it. And then we'll start doing striding that, like building up that until we start to lose it. So what'll happen is the hip flexors, they're very lazy, like by nature, and they'll fatigue quite fast. Like in the first night you do this, you'll talk to athletes and they'll be like, geez, my hip flexors are killing me and my calves. And I'll say, yeah, because you're on the balls of your feet like that. You've never had this much pressure on your calves. And they said, they tell me like, well, I can calf raise 110 kg. And I said, yeah, but sprinting is five times your body weight at nine meters a second, 10 meters a second for some guys. I said, the fastest you can move any weight is one meter a second. And you can't move much more than strong guys, two times your body weight. So it's a stimulus that you can't replicate in the gym. Like, you just can't. So I think doing the thing is the, like as one of my friends, Carver Coach, and says, Paul Kilgannon, we have to keep the most important thing the most important thing. And I think that's very important with sprinting. The actual mechanics and the sprinting are the most important thing. Like. So, um, yeah, that's what it looked like. And then when they're doing it right, then we'll, um, we'll, we'll take pictures of it as well and we'll, we'll show the angles and there's the difference. I'll put them in a split screen sometimes. So on one, you'll see the leg down here and then the, the, the leg at the right angle. So that's the before and that's the after with the knees. Um, and they, 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 it's like Eureka dropping. And I'll even tell them, save the proper one as your screensaver on your phone. Because, uh, you know, I, the subconscious has huge power to say, like, if we see something before we sleep, our body will figure out how to achieve it a lot of the time. Like, like if you set an alarm and you're awake before it, like, sometimes. Like, that happens to me 90% of the time if I set an alarm, except the times it really matters. I miss them once. But if I set an alarm, like, I'll set it for 7, 7 o'clock, I'll often be awake at 10 to 7, knock it off, you know? So, so subconscious figures stuff out, like, that's what they say it goes in. So, um, I'll, I'll do a bit of that, like, yeah. And uh, sometimes I run with them. Um, Sometimes I have to run with them because I lose their belief after a year or two. Like, because you're showing them basics every year. You're going back, right back to basics. And Potty, what's his name? Is it Potty Mulher? No, not Potty Mulher. Potty, he was the head of the GA. Potty Butler. He had a lovely thing I heard him say one day. He said, basics, you know, it's, it sounds like it's beneath us. He said, I call them fundamentals. And that means stuff we can't survive without. And I think that makes so much sense. Like, so, like, the basics I do with the running, and there's so much fancy stuff out there, so much of it. But, like, that's the stuff I see that I get the Olympic athlete from 9.9 seconds to 9.7. But I'm trying to get guys from 14 and 13 seconds down to 11 seconds over 100 meters. So, like, uh, basics are, like, they're, they're everything, you know? Even in boxing, when I box footwork, high guard, basics are everything, like, but they're not pretty, and we all want to jump to the fancy stuff. They're not pretty, they're not exciting, but they really work. So again, I'm back to what I started this this talk with. The group has to be right. The group has to be so hungry that they go, we don't care if it's not exciting. We don't care if it's basic. Give it to us. We want it. And that's, again, now that I have to find the right group for that. Like It's not for everyone. So I've referenced a couple of times the, couple the interview I did with Ross last year. For those who don't know, Ross King, the lead trailer. I interviewed Ross before the All Ireland final, and uh, just talking about your work with you. And one thing he said during that was that uh, one thing I know about Martin is that he'll get teams to a, a breaking point. Now, the reason I bring that up is because you talked there about getting teams to realise their potential and actually how far you can go, you know, and as opposed to maybe turning up and giving seven, eight, out of ten. So I'm wondering how much of your role do you see being 
getting people to you know realize proper and efficient mechanics and how much of your role is getting someone to realize that they can actually push themselves beyond what they have been doing for the last you know a couple of seasons well i hope that's my role and i hope it's always my role because that's the only role i want like like we're looking at waterford we have a great strength and conditioning coach tommy ryan and tommy's you know he's a humble man he probably won't do things like this like i will and you know I've, once or twice i forgot to give him recognition he's absolutely excellent and He'll prime the athletes and he'll do all the strength and power with them, but he won't do it like a bodybuilder. He, he's really, really good at it. He's, he owns CrossFit, inter, CrossFit, CrossFit internalists. He's doing it for years and he builds them into what I need them to be athletes like him. By the time I get my hands on them, like they're, they're, they're ready. So thankfully I don't need to do any strength or power work. That's all done. I'm going to teach the mechanics and then with boxing, I'm going to get inside their lungs and their heads. So we'll just, I'll go back to the club at the moment because that's what's going on at the moment. The club will learn and that's fresh in my head. Um, we are all to do that. I, I don't enjoy the running. <clears throat> I just see the value in it. I find the running boring. I find it boring, but I just know how, how worthwhile it is. I just know it has to be done. And the players, they find the benefit in it. So I do the running. I don't love it, but I love the other end of the spectrum where we're going into the dark territory. Like, and it, like, I've heard all this, like, even with Kulari, they were looking for a three-year transition for me and Culbert to go in and bring them to a three-year plan. And we said, that's grand, yeah. Can be a three-year plan, but we're going to try win in year one. And however far we get, we'll try better year two. Like, like we, we were like, it doesn't have to be a three-year plan, but we're not going to hold back for the first year. So, and people were saying to me, like, but it takes years to build that level of conditioning. And I said, like, but what are you doing if it takes years? Like, because I see humans joining the army and they can't run a kilometre. And they have spots and their love handles and they, they can't move. And like, what, 16 weeks later, they're going over a mountain with no sleep and their own weight in the backpack. And, it's, and they're, they're unbreakable. Like these guys who couldn't run a kilometre will now cover 20 kilometres over a mountain with no sleep, no food, cold and wet, tired. They cried on the first run and they stopped. They gave in. But by just constantly, just constantly tapping into that, Microos and suffering, building their belief, showing them how strong they come. I see the humans change, they're unrecognizable. The love handles are gone. He's standing erect and proud and robust, resilience. They're all terms we wrote in the army like regularly. Resilience, robustness, uh, moral courage, physicality, leadership, like you know, moral courage, doing the right thing. You know, stuff like that. Like and we, we put that into the teams. Well, I definitely try to put it into the teams. As much as I can, like, um, and I don't believe it takes three years. I really don't. Like. And I've seen it now on several occasions with different teams at every level. It doesn't take three years to catch up and get with the top of the pack. And Tyrone have shown it this year too. And I look at Naylor and all these boys this year and they look slim and lean. Like I've seen him bigger than that now. He looked like there was more gym and now he looks super fit. I'll actually have to chat him about that. Like I haven't chatted him now about a year. I'll actually have to chat him about that because he looks super lean and slim and Matty Donnelly and these guys now and they're covering that ground really easy. Like, <clears throat> like I over, I understand the emphasis on strength for sports like wrestling, sports like rugby, but in GA, when a guy grabs you, your, your whole energy is trying to get away. And once you've got away, it's a mobility game again. It's how much ground can you cover? How quick can you cover it? How often can you cover it? You know, how many breaks of play can you run to have? Because that's possible in possessions. And the more possessions you have, the better game you have. So how many of them can you keep getting to without breaking down, without fatigue, and without lactic acid building in your legs? And that's all heart and lungs. And probably up there, but the will is only strong enough as long as you have the engine to sustain it. Like I've had will in the boxing ring. I got stopped in an Irish title fight in kickboxing. I had all the will in the world to go on, but my, my legs couldn't stand. I couldn't hold my hands up. I had broken ribs training and I only got three weeks to train for it. And I had all the will in the world. I wanted that title so bad, but I couldn't stand. I couldn't fight. I had to go back in the corner with my hands up and say, he either knocked me out or the ref will stop it. And he came in and clobbered me and the ref came in and stopped it. And that was it. I, but my will was there. I just, there's no energy to supply it. And it's the very same with the engine. You can have the engine, but if the will isn't there, you're not going to go as far as you can either because you'll accept stuff. I always say we're gamblers when we're playing sports too, right? We're a wing forward and we're gambling, or a wing back maybe, and we're gambling when we're fresh. We're like, it's going to come in, it's going to come in, it's going to come in, and you're always ready. And then after 40 minutes, and when the gateway is gone out of the system, and you're standing there, and you're like, it won't come in, it won't come in. And it comes in, and your man got the five yards on you, and everyone's empty. Like, I think it's all just, 
I think it's all down to your engine and your will you know, when it comes to match day. I really do. Like, I don't think it matters how high you jumped in a vertical jump three weeks before the match. I really don't. Like, there's more to jumping for volume the height of your vertical jump. There's timing, there's positioning, there's skill in it, there's the will to win it. I've seen guys not as good, at, like, not as high jumpers outfield in other guys every day of the week. Brian Carroll, tiny little guy, catches lots of balls. You know, it's funny again. So, Martin, for any player who's uh, listen, after listening to this podcast and they're ready to run through walls or any coach who wants to help them do it, uh, what's, your, what's your piece of advice? Like, What are you telling them? Where, where do they start if they're looking to get faster or if a coach is looking to try and help his team realise that? Can you give them some sort of indicator? Can you give them some sort of indicator? Let's think, firstly, if it's overcomplicated or if it's, I don't know, like, like it's... It's quite simple. Like all this stuff is really simple, and it's online. Like you know, I did on the courses, but I learned a lot. Probably learned more online in my own research from my own sprinting. I didn't have a coach, like you know, and I was running pretty fast times. I mean, like um, it's all out there to be got. Like and and don't doubt doubt yourself with it. You know, we have a brain that has a strong filter as well. Like we know what's good, and we we know what's crap. If it looks over complicated, it probably does some work. And it, or it's probably for these minor, minute percentage benefits yeah. that you're being told. But the real good stuff is the basics, and it's simple, and it's repetition of basics till we create habits. Like you're trying to wire neural pathways in your brain that you've never had before, and that's just going to take patience and repetition. So keep it simple. Look up the basics of strengthen. Look up mechanics, and pick three three exercises that would you believe in. You can't go wrong with high knees. Uh, heel recovery and scissor blades. There are, are three I bring everywhere. Maybe some bounding, some some plyos, not much. And then just running and but staying disciplined, not trying to be fast early. I see people trying to do that. They're trying to be fast early. But when you're going fast, you have no feel for what's actually happening. Running is a skill that you need to be aware of and you need to be developing and constantly in touch with how it feels. The time to be fast is on match day or on training when the ball is thrown in. But when you're practicing, it's learning. So slow it down. Work on the technique, work on getting the angles where they should be in the legs, your body, and um, stick to basics. You'll be okay, like, and don't complicate, don't pay a fortune for it. It's, so it's all right. It's, it's out there to be got, like, it's not, it's not hidden away, you know. I, I defy anybody to, to listen to this podcast and not get something out of it. Martin, thanks for coming to talking to us today.